We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands, now part of Treaty 6 and shared by many nations. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of the indigenous peoples who have called this land home and who enrich our vibrant community. Jennifer Leota Gray writes, We come together every week bound not by a creed or a mutual desire to please one God or many gods, yet we are drawn together by a belief that how we are in the world, who we are together, matters. We light this chalice together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change the world. In the last two services, I've spoken about the basics of our faith tradition, about the things that define us as Unitarians without limiting or restricting us. There are seven principles to help us as we wrestle with challenging issues, six sources that describe the traditions and philosophies that inspire and support us. You can find these within the first couple of pages of the hymn book and also online, and as I say, the sermons are posted. Now, those principles and sources are held in common throughout all of our congregations in Canada and the United States and are deeply respected by other Unitarian groups around the world. However, this congregation, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, exists as a freestanding organization within that larger community. We are corporately independent. We are under no external authority. No denominational figure can give us orders, least of all the minister. Within Unitarian Universalism, there is no higher decision-making authority than a duly constituted congregational meeting. Yet, as responsible people, we try to work cooperatively with other congregations and denominational groups. We share best practices. We attend each other's events when we can. We learn from one another. I mention the independence only to point out that with that comes responsibility to manage our own affairs and especially to live out our own vision of what Unitarian is in this community. So periodically we need to take a look at that and redefine who we are and who we wish to be. So in 2015, members of our community revisited our vision statement as part of a much larger strategic planning process that lasted the best part of a year. And they developed a statement designed to tell the world and to remind us who we are and who we strive to be. The full text, as approved by the congregation, reads, The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a congregation openly and honestly searching, learning, connecting, and serving. Searching for spiritual meaning in our lives, learning to understand ourselves and others, connecting to build fair, caring communities, serving each other and our communities near and far. If you look at the top of your order of service, you will see the rubrics, searching, learning, connecting, and serving. And they are weekly reminders of what we're about in this place. It's a good statement. Concise, clear, without limiting how we might put that vision into practice. It encourages us to look at what we do together now and see how everything fits together. For example, the food bank distribution thing connects us to a wider community and as does most of our social justice work. It's there that we live out our principles into a wider community. Our education programs assist in searching for meaning and learning about the world and the life of the spirit. Our choir, Coriolis, works at the search for meaning even as they build connection and strengthen our community. You see how it can work, how it should work. And by the way, I'll just mention, for those of you who are new today, two weeks from now our choir is singing their first service. That's not to be missed. And the vision only is going to work if it's a living thing, something that guides and affirms our actions and serves as the touchstones for newcomers and longtime members alike who might be asking, 
what exactly are we doing here? Most importantly, it must be a set of concepts easy to take in, yet challenging to live up to. Most of us come here wondering, can I make some more sense out of my life? Thinking about searching, learning, connecting, and serving is a good place to begin answering that question. It is, it is a critical question in our lives, really, a very personal and intimate question, of course. And it's one I've asked myself frequently in different ways over the last four decades. Forty years ago, I walked into a Unitarian church for the first time. It was the Unitarian church in Montreal. And to be perfectly honest, I was dragged by a girlfriend. But at that time, I was a frustrated and lapsed Catholic who didn't even realize that there was a possibility of another kind of spiritual expression or that I was looking for one. And it was there that I encountered a community very different from the one in which I'd been raised. For the first time, I was encouraged to search for meaning in the company of others. I wasn't being taught what that meaning was supposed to be. I was supposed to go figure it out for myself. That was liberating and terrifying. Now, some people arrive in our congregations and they know instantly that they have found their new home. That wasn't me. Too much Irish Catholicism in my blood. I was cautious and I was wary of organized religion. But I listened. I read a bit. I started the process of learning both about Unitarianism and started to figure out my own journey learning to understand myself and others. Still, it would be three years before I joined a church, and then it would be in Toronto. And I finally joined because I was lonely in this new big city, and I needed community. The strategic plan that led to this vision statement did some research. And in the research, they came up with four key points. And the very first point was community is key. Back then, I wanted a community that was more than a social club. I wanted a religious connection. Somewhere where I mattered and was respected and got to think for myself. And I found it in the Unitarian Church. As my own journey deepened a few years later, I found myself called to ministry, which <laughs> was a huge surprise to me. But I've never regretted it. What I found, I wanted to share with others. I wanted to encourage people to discover free religion for themselves. I wanted to help explain the power of those ideas our rubrics describe. And if those ideas suited the makeup of the people that I met along the way, then I hoped to welcome them into one of our communities. And ministry also kept me pushing to go deeper in my own journey. Well, once trained and ordained, I served for 10 years in the mainland, uh, the lower mainland of British Columbia, helping to found a brand new congregation and working on a number of national projects and committees. But there came a moment when it felt like it was right to leave that church, when that now seven-year-old community needed to seek a different kind of leadership. So I started to look around. This congregation happened to be in search, so I applied. Your search committee invited me to be their candidate in 1997. Now, the tradition when that happens is to present the candidate to the whole congregation for an entire week of meetings and services and lunches and dinners and coffees and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the week, the ministerial candidate leaves and the congregation votes. You see... The denomination helps with matching, but remember, there is no higher decision-making body than a Unitarian congregation. You, the members of the church, you decide. But before that memorable and intense week, the search committee and I had to go through in a long confidential process of them getting to know me and deciding if I was a right fit, and I had to go through the same process for myself. 
I came to Edmonton for a weekend in the winter. A really cold weekend. Really cold weekend. It's like minus 30 all weekend. For what's called a pre-candidating visit. And it's sort of a set of secret meetings. We met as a group for several hours over the weekend, and then I also met each member of the search committee individually for an hour or so. They were open, they were candid, and a sense of excitement began to grow in me. It looked like we shared a very similar vision of what ministry and ministry in this church could be. I was extremely fortunate to have two Canadian congregations offer me candidacy that year, Both were attractive. It was a difficult decision. After all, I would be uprooting my life and taking a big risk on the future, just hoping that I'd made the right choice. So I talked with colleagues and family. I did lists of pros and cons, um, shared them with a wise elder I knew. And after reading it all through and talking to me for a while, he said, you know, you're trying to even up the pros and the cons, but when you're looking at this site, it feels kind of forced, and when you're looking at Edmonton, it's not. You're trying to be fair, but you've really already made your decision. And suddenly I knew he was right. So... Why did I choose here? Why did I come here? What was it that was on those lists? Well, I got to tell you, one of the really attractive things was you had a church building. The congregation we'd started in BC was meeting in rented space three hours a week. The church office was a desk in my spare room or the front seat of my car. The idea of having a place I could go to work every day was really attractive. But that wasn't the big choice. In the end, the real deciding factor was this wonderful sense of institutional maturity, I felt. The leadership of this congregation, and this is rare, if not unique, the leadership of this congregation had a clear and appropriate understanding of what ministers can and should do. They equally had a clear and sharp understanding of what the work of the leaders and the members should be. This community has known that since its re-founding in 1954. They understand that the members are responsible for governance, finance, maintenance, and all of those bedrock kinds of things on which the minister and the congregation can build good worship, good programs, strong sense of community, celebrations, social justice outreach, community building. All of those things need your leadership to provide the base before the rest of it can happen. They understood that they, you, were the church, not me. The minister can support them in their work and offer religious leadership and services and programs and consolation and sometimes be a spokesperson for our faith in the community. But I don't get to tell you what your religion has to be. And I don't get to tell you how you must run your affairs. In this congregation, the minister works with the leadership, not for it. I do not dictate the direction of the church. That's up to you. Ministers ideally help congregations achieve the goals that you set. From that first moment of contact with the search committee, I was treated openly and fairly. The congregational materials offered an accurate picture of how things were, and people were open about what they liked and what they hoped to change. I think that both with the committee and the congregation, I was also open and honest. There were frank discussions and reasonable expectations. The search committee decided I would be a good fit and recommended me. The congregation decided to take a chance on me. You voted unanimously to call me. I haven't regretted my decision for a minute. I confess I had my doubts about moving to Alberta. But today I consider myself a proud Edmontonian (laughs) and will be until I die. After the service, I'm going to be meeting with our Ministerial Relations Committee for the first time this year. They're the body elected directly by you 
by the members of the congregation to carry on those same kinds of frank and open discussions that were begun by the search committee. If you have concerns about my work, you can speak to any of them. Open communication is the key. When the leadership and the minister have a similar view of our separate and shared responsibilities, we are able to build a symbiotic relationship. And mostly, I think that exists and has been a key to shared ministry now entering its 22nd year. But my retirement is coming, of course. I will turn 65 in 19 months. So sooner or later, UCE will have to look for a new and no doubt different kind of leadership. In the year past, I've had conversations with our leaders, and without attaching dates, we've agreed to think that it's about time to consider this transition time coming towards us. It's getting to be time for a change. Some of you probably think it's long past. I hope it's going to be orderly and cooperative, reflecting that cooperative sharing of leadership we've enjoyed for so long. The period ahead offers time to reflect on what the congregation likes and what you would like to see done differently. How would you like to be searching for spiritual meaning? What would be involved in learning to understand yourselves and others? What help would you need in that part of the journey? How will you go about connecting and building fair and caring communities? And what will define serving one another and communities near and far? There is a well-established process and set of tools and professional expertise available from the Canadian Unitarian Council to help you with that series of conversations. Typically, there will be an interim minister brought in for one or two years after I step down. You will have support as you do this work, but I expect it will also be rich and rewarding time for you, and it will take all of you. This vision statement will be the great tool as you make those choices. It is a wonderful compass for setting your future direction. I have every confidence that when that transition comes, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton will have a pretty clear sense of itself and a willingness to keep looking at its vision for the future and keep evolving to fit the times. Amen.